Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for Tuesday's COVID-19 briefing here in the state of Tennessee. Uh, our hope today is to provide you more information about what it is that we're doing in our state, uh, innovative and creative, I believe, ways to address this COVID-19 crisis that we face and the economic uh, implications of that. Uh, yesterday, I talked a little bit about innovation and how our uh, institutions of higher learning, our colleges and our TCATs were producing um, via 3D printing some face shields and I showed one of those yesterday and uh, I just want to I want to tell you that after we talked about that other states have reached out to our state to ask how it is that we're doing that and our universities have given them um, information about how we are and they are now producing those shields and I say that because I said yesterday Tennessee would be a part of the national answer, and that's one little example of how we're doing that. I also want to also want to just uh, give a, a, a real shout out to some of the companies in our state that are helping us with this effort. So, I've said many times before we got to do this together, and that includes our private sector as well. We've had significant personal protective equipment donations from. Uh, from institutions, companies, from Lowe's, TVA, Seco Concrete, multiple construction companies that have d donated and delivered supplies to, um, to our National Guard armories. I also want to thank physicians and dentists. Uh, we signed an executive order that suspended uh, elective procedures and surgeries, and, and those procedures and surgeries come at a real cost to, to dentists and to physicians because it's parts of their practice. But the, the outpouring of personal protective equipment from those dentist practices and from physicians across the state to the National Guard Armory uh, has been significant, and I want to thank them for it. Together, we are going to do this. Um, we're going to talk about what we're doing today, but together we are going to get through this in a way that makes all Tennesseans proud. Today, our case count is 667 confirmed cases in Tennessee, and we have conducted more than 11,000 tests in our state. Dr. Pishy will provide more information about this in a little bit, but I want to remind every Tennessean that you can't put too much, uh, too much importance on one day's worth of data. Uh, we do know that our numbers will climb as we increase testing across the state, and we have a tremendous challenge ahead of us that we are structured to, to uh, meet, and we're, we're doing things every day that are going to meet them. I want to talk a little bit about that today. I will address uh, the use of our National Guard. I'm going to focus today on a series of deadlines that we are extending uh, to ensure that Tennesseans can uh, continue to socially distance, and I'm going to also talk about some um, initiatives that we are bringing forth to help both businesses and indiv individuals who are facing unique economic challenges as a result uh, of this virus. National Guard. I've mobilized the use of the National Guard, and uh, Major General Holmes is here to answer questions about that if there are any later, but uh, we are utilizing 250 National Guard personnel, uh, including 150 who are medically trained um, in, in this 250 that we're going to use. These personnel are being used to assist 35 remote assessment sites uh, all across our state, mostly in our rural communities, as the virus spreads into uh, our rural counties. And a couple things about these, these guardsmen and women, these, these men and women that serve in the Guard. Uh, many of them are technically trained in, in uh, the medical field. But we are not taking National Guard personnel from healthcare related private sector jobs. Uh, these are going to be folks that are otherwise in other positions in their, in their work or families that, that they have medical technical uh, training. So it will be very helpful for us as we staff these assessment facilities and later as they're used for, uh, for, for healthcare treatment for those who have uh, the virus. And I also, by the way, want to commend the private employers who are working with us to allow those uh, members of the Guard to uh, take this time to help serve in their state 
and to take leaves of absence from, from their businesses. I said I wanted to tell you about a few deadlines we're extending. Uh, I've directed state workers to, who are currently working from home to remain working from home. We originally had, the, had um, intended for them to work from home until the end of the month, but we've extended that deadline to the 24th of April. We currently have about 23,000 state workers that are now working from home. Uh, and those workers will stay working from home till the 24th. Regarding education and uh, deadlines for education, as we continue to assess the spread of COVID-19, uh, we are asking all schools that here in the state of Tennessee to remain closed now until April the 24th. Uh, we originally had a deadline to the end of the month, and we believe that it's important and necessary for us to extend that deadline. Now. Let me say a couple words about that. We want our kids to continue to learn through the extension of this deadline. And I've, I've said many times that I talk to other governors uh, across the country, and I do that every day. And our Department of Education, our Commissioner Penny Schwinn, works with other educationer, uh, education commissioners across the country as well to find best practices. We want our kids to continue to learn, and so we are working to uh, look at alternative ways for kids to learn through online uh, educational opportunities. We just recently uh, secured a partnership with PBS to offer instructional content in a, in a short term and interim period for kids um, while they're at home through television. So we're working really hard to make sure that our kids continue to learn while we have these school closures and we will uh, reevaluate school closure uh, as we as we reevaluate this virus as it moves through our community. Uh, Commissioner Swins here in case there are questions uh, regarding education. I also want to talk about a couple other deadlines. Real ID. President Trump uh, announced yesterday that he was going to extend the uh, date for the, that we, at which uh, Americans had to have a real ID. And because of that, we are not going to re issue real ID until May the 18th. Uh, Tennesseans don't need to worry about getting their real ID, uh, and we will not open that back up until May 18th because the federal deadline has been extended as well. By the way, I have signed uh, an executive order that also waives emission testing requirements for Tennesseans through May 18th. So uh, if, your, if your emissions test was due sometime in this period, uh, it, will, it will be extended until May 18th. As we all know, um, COVID-19 has severely impacted our economy across the country. It is severely impacting our economy in Tennessee. It's caused a great deal of business disruption, and we are working hard to uh, provide targeted relief and to, and to help businesses and individuals work their way through the economic challenges that come as a result of this health challenge. So to better serve our Tennessee businesses, I have uh, directed the Department of Revenue to delay the filing deadline for franchise and excise business taxes to July 15th of 2020. So businesses will have until July 15th to file those returns and make any payments. Those were originally due, filed, and payments due in April. Uh, it, it, that, that is to help Tennessee businesses. We also want to help Tennessee individuals who are facing unique challenges economically. We've talked already previously about uh, TANF funding and about SNAP benefits and about unemployment insurance and a number of ways that the state is, um, is helping individuals who find themselves in a very difficult financial position as a result of this, but we, we're continuing to work. So the Attorney General, in consultation with our office, has filed an emergency petition asking the Tennessee Public Utility Commission to prohibit utilities from disconnecting service for non-payment during the state of emergency. So if Tennesseans uh, find themselves in a situation where they can't make their utility payments during this uh, economic crisis that is coming alongside this health crisis, uh, we're working with the Public Service Utility Commission to, um, the Public Utility Commission to make certain that they don't get those utilities cut off, and we're urging the commission to address that promptly. We've made that request. 
I've also directed the Department of Commerce and Insurance to issue guidance to insurance providers across Tennessee to request flexibility, as much flexibility as possible, to avoid cancellation of insurance payments, of insurance policies for non-payment. Um, and, and I've asked them also to implement grace periods as employers and individuals navigate this crisis. So we want to provide uh, policy payment help through this time as well as help around um, utilities. I will, uh, I will, all, I, I'll open it up for questions here. Uh, I want to close this portion just by saying, you know, we've outlined today a number of steps that we believe will be important to Tennesseans. Deadlines, um, uh, extension of those deadlines, targeted relief to businesses and to individuals, uh, work that's being done, what we're doing to mitigate the spread of this disease and its economic impact on Tennesseans. We can do a lot in state government. We can do a lot in, in local governments. We can do a lot through the private sector. We can institute policies and uh, reduce regulation and make it easier for each one of us to uh, navigate through this. But at the end of the day, it's going to be up to you, every individual Tennessean, to help stop the spread of this disease through Tennessee. You have to take personal responsibility to heed all of the guidance and all of the suggestions to take this incredibly seriously and to make sure that we save the lives of our neighbors and that we limit the economic challenges that our state will face going forward. Be happy to open it up now to questions and we have a number of folks in the room that can help with answering those questions um, if necessary. So. Lines are open for question. At this time, we'll go to Kim Crusey with the AP. Kim, you're unmuted. Oh, I'm sorry. I am unmuted. I, okay. Hi, Governor. Um, my question uh, is that the president today said that he was hoping that the nation could be back open for business, basically almost returning to almost sort of normalcy by Easter. Do you feel that that is a realistic timeline for Tennessee? Well, I'm, we're trying to take a really long approach to, um, uh, to this spread of this virus and to the impacts that it'll have in our state. We know that certainly the virus is spreading in Tennessee right now, um, that our numbers are going up, they're going to continue to go up, and because of that, the unemployment in this state will uh, will likely go up as people are removed from the workforce. And so we know that certainly the impacts in Tennessee are not going to be over by Easter. Um, and we're planning for a long runway in both the economic impacts and the medical impacts. Um, you know, different parts of the country in different stages. And so what we're seeing in different places is impacting uh, policy decisions on a national level, but here in Tennessee, we know that uh, we have a tremendous challenge ahead of us, and we are gearing up for what is to come. And, and let me just say this, we're not afraid of what's coming, we just are aware of what's coming, and we are preparing for what's coming, and we are, uh, we are opening up beds and, and finding new sources of PPE, and we are reducing regulations to allow for more health care providers. And we're doing everything we can to protect those providers. So uh, we're, we're aware of what is coming. We don't know the extent of it, but we certainly know that it is coming. And we know that it's going to be a challenge, but we believe that we're going to be able to address that challenge and get through it. Thank you, Kimberly. Next, we'll go to Jason Lamb with News Channel 5. Jason, your, your line is unmuted. Governor, yesterday you talked about the right time for the right decision on if or when to issue a stay-at-home order. We know a lot of developments can change, but I think a lot of Tennesseans want to know, what does that right time look like for you right now? What specific combination of numbers or measurements or data would tell you that it's time to issue a stay-at-home order statewide? What level of numbers would you need to see and where? 
You know, um, there is a lot of data that we are taking in to determine, and a lot of that is, is coming online in a meaningful way. So until you have a lot of testing, for example, um, a substantive amount of testing across the state, you know very little about what that testing really means, but that, that's, that's improving significantly. So we're starting to get more data around testing. We're starting to number, understand the number of negative tests that we have. Uh, so we know about how many people are, as a percentage, are actually testing positive. I have actually worked with, uh, I've, I've been in consultation with our former U.S. Senator Frist, uh, around modeling, and he is working with Vanderbilt to provide us a Tennessee-specific model for what we think uh, the spread of this virus might look like. Uh, we're, we're looking at, how, at, at, the, at the types of community spread we have in different counties. Uh, we're, we're also analyzing the data uh, for which municipalities have different restrictions in place for social distancing. There's a lot of data, and it comes in, and, and as, it, uh, as you assimilate that data, then you, you, you make decisions about the right time for the right decision uh, for the right place. Every, as you know, I've said before, every county's different, every city's different, every state's different. That's why I talk to governors every day in, in states that are similar to ours to try to understand their data points as well. Um, but, but I believe that we will make the right decisions at the right times. I told that to every major uh, city mayor. I was on a call with them uh, today, the, the mayors from every one of our major cities, including the county mayors from those cities. And uh, we're working together in a, in a unified way to make decisions that are gonna protect the safety of every Tennessean and protect our economy to the degree that we can. Right, next up, Andy Scher from the Times Free Press. Andy, your line is unmuted. Great. Uh, hello, Governor. Uh, had a several part question here, deals, but all on the same to topic. One is, do you have figures and what are they for how many Tennesseans have died from coronavirus at this point? And, uh, and, and secondly, uh, how many people have uh, at, at this juncture been hospitalized? Dr. Pearcy, do you want to um, let, let me let Dr. Pearcy step up and, and answer that question? Um, Dr. Pearson. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for the question, Andy. Uh, and that gives me an opportunity to tell you about uh, what to expect as we get more data, more data coming in. So your first question, I believe, was about deaths. And on our website today, you will see two deaths. That does not necessarily mean there has only been two deaths. As an official state report, we have to wait until the medical examiner, the death certificate, uh, all of that data comes in. So you very well may hear of additional deaths before we officially report it. We will get those in, we will get those reported, but there is a pretty significant verification process that we use prior to reporting those, so that you're gonna see a lag there. Um, as related to hospitalized patients, uh, it's actually a similar answer. So as we start to get data in on who is hospitalized, there is a lag in that. Uh, I was talking to the governor about it this morning. Oftentimes these patients present uh, with respiratory difficulties, perhaps pneumonia, uh, and then once they are tested, there is some delay in that, some lag, uh, and so it might be a few days before we can report hospitalized data. Right now we're running around a 10% hospitalization, uh, which is just a little lower than what we have seen nationally. I believe and, and our experts believe that maybe because we are disproportionately higher in the younger age groups, uh, and so I want to take this opportunity to uh, call out that 20 to 40 year old age group uh, and actually uh, raise the bar on social distancing. I understand that it's easy to think, I'm young, I'm healthy, uh, this may not affect me as badly, but as you've heard the governor say on many occasions and, and me as well, uh, you're still at risk and you're still putting others at risk. So because we are having that disproportionate younger population, uh, we are right now having a lower than average hospitalization rate. Uh, I'm not certain that that trend will hold.
Next, we'll go to Jeremy Finley from WSMV. Jeremy, your line is unmuted. All right, Governor, thank you for taking the questions today. The questions I have to do, I have, are about testing. In, in particular, I believe that the state has only, is only working with two private labs right now uh, to run the test. And we've spoken to some local uh, labs that also want to be involved in the effort. Uh, they actually have the machinery to run the, the, the test. They just don't have the necessary supplies in order to do it. So the question is, why is it Tennessee's government doing more to partner with more local labs and to get them the supplies they need in order to run these tests? Uh, thank you for that question um, because that allows me the opportunity uh, to brag on a group that we've got at TEMA that is exploring every possible opportunity to maximize supplies of all of the different components of testing. And I also will take this opportunity to highlight something that the governor alluded to a few minutes ago, which is um, a concerning uh, trend that I have seen uh, in social media outlets and in other uh, media outlets recently. You may have noticed that over the last few days, our rate of rise has been less. And so maybe there's only 50 new cases or 75 new cases as opposed to 100 or 200 like we had. Please know that does not represent a flattening of the curve. We cannot prematurely back off of our social distancing efforts. What that is reflective of is as the demand for testing grows, the lag time or the turnaround time on that testing will also grow. So please don't be falsely reassured that our numbers have been lower lately as far as daily rise, because I think very soon you will, you will see a pretty significant pickup in that number. That's not to frighten anyone, but it's to uh, caution against a, a false sense of reassurance. You wanna address the other labs? Yes, sir, thank you, I'm sorry. Um, so there are multiple labs uh, in the state that are providing uh, private testing in addition to the uh, state public health lab. Uh, you've got three major lab vendors across the state that uh, almost every provider and hospital are contracted with in some form or fashion. We are also starting to see some uh, smaller labs across the state have the capability uh, to provide testing. Uh, and as of late last week, uh, there were some reduced restrictions from the FDA to help speed that process. Uh, and we are working with uh, multiple companies across Tennessee uh, to help build capacity, even in small numbers, because every little bit helps. Uh, one, one final point, there is a technology that is uh, due to come online, hopefully as early as next Monday, uh, that has more of a 45 minute to an hour long turnaround time on, at the point of care instead of having to swab, send off to a lab, and come back several days later. Uh, we're very excited about this technology and are aware of several labs across the state that will offer this testing. Um, and as long as we can keep that supply chain up, uh, as you've already mentioned, uh, we're looking forward to uh, expanding our testing capabilities then. Next, we'll go to Natalie Allison with the Tennessee. And Natalie, you're live. Hi, Governor. Um, Hi, my question is about uh, this ongoing conversation that we've been seeing, um, particularly among uh, the president. I know the lieutenant governor of Texas last night made comments about this. Senator Corker has also made comments about is, is the cure for coronavirus worse than disease itself um, at some time, suggesting that we should uh, maybe lessen some of these restrictions to allow the economy to go on despite people falling ill. Um, that that would be better than the economy totally falling into disrepair. What do you say to that? And and do you think um, these concerns about the economy could outweigh the public health concerns? I think that we have, um, uh, you know, we have a public health crisis. There's no doubt about it. And what motivates me in our decision-making process is that if we don't address this public health crisis, Tennesseans are going to lose their lives. We already, or some already have, more will. Um, we do have a, an unfolding economic crisis that is gonna profoundly in negative ways, not just economically, but in healthcare, in their mental health status, in uh, levels of poverty, if it goes, if it goes uh, uh, too far. So we, we have both. And there is a way to address both. 
and to address them in ways that I believe mitigate both. That's my goal. My goal is that Tennessee takes the right steps at the right time, as I've said, that we don't uh, run after what somebody else is doing or uh, listen too much to what voices are coming from outside of Tennessee as much as what is happening right here in Tennessee. I do believe that we are very thoughtful, both from our, our city mayors, uh, our county mayors, from, from the governor's office working together as leaders in the state. We are very thoughtful about the fact that we want to we want to protect Tennesseans' lives and their health, and we also want to protect their livelihoods. It's it's a real balance there, Natalie, that has to be uh, that has to be carried at the same time. But uh, we don't think you have to sacrifice one for the other, and we don't think you have to choose. We actually think if we do this right, we can we can mitigate both to the to the highest degree possible. Next up, we'll go to Kara Hartnett with the National Post. Kara, your line is unmuted. Hi. Uh, so how is the National Supply Chain delaying assessment centers from going up all over the state? And how are we faring as a state in receiving supplies as opposed to other states? And do you have an update on the count of ICU beds and ventilators? I'll let Dr. Piercy, you got, you got all that? I think so. Uh, I'll, I'll try to remember those questions, and if I miss one, um, please, please uh, remind me. So as far as the supply chain, uh, this issue is affecting every state equally. I shared with the governor yesterday that I spoke with my counterparts in all of the southern states, and the issues were identical. The logistics operations unit that I referenced earlier has been working tire tirelessly over the last couple of weeks to source every bit of PPE, testing materials um, and uh, even ventilators as you heard last week. Uh, even as you heard yesterday, we have uh, been innovative and in sourcing some of our own in-state uh, where we can and that does give us a leg up on other states. Regarding your question on ICU beds and ventilators, I glanced at those numbers just before I came in here. Um, we are still uh, in really good shape. We've got over 30% of all of our hospital beds statewide still available uh, and close to 70% of our ventilators available. And that does not include the new ones that we ordered last week. Uh, so right now we're in good shape. Next, we'll go to Chris Bungard with WKRN. Chris, your line is unmuted. Chris, we can't we can't hear you with your headset. We'll come back. We'll come back to you. Next, we'll go to Sam Stocker with the Daily Memphian. Sam, your line is unmuted. Thank you, Governor. Appreciate the time. Yes, sir. Uh, coordinator answered a, a lawmaker's questions uh, about the coming election last week with very few specifics. Do you have any inkling of what the uh, plan would be to conduct elections? I know it's still, you know, a few months off, but no one knows how long this is going to last. Uh, do you know what the plan will be? And do you think the state should use vote by mail or universal absentee voting? You know, those, those questions would be for Secretary of State Hargett um, as his part of his responsibility is to oversee elections. So, and he and I have not talked about what his plan is for that. Um, been kind of focused on this, on, on the, the issue at hand, but that is certainly a very important issue. And I'm sure Secretary Hargett's working on it. You might, you might address that question with him. Next, we'll go to Marta Aldrich with Chalkbeat. Marta, your line is unmuted. Thank you. Governor, you said that you would like for students to continue to learn, even as schools are going to be shuttered for almost a month longer than you initially had recommended. But can I get you to speak how, uh, given the wide disparity in resources we have from district to district? Given that federal guidelines um, require parity for special education students. Uh, yeah, you know what? I'm actually going to ask uh, Commissioner Swin because she and we have been talking about 
innovative approaches that other states are taking, but she's actually been working on the ground with the uh, with the particular strategy that we have in Tennessee. So I'll, I'll let I'll let Penny address that. Sure. Thank you. So. We've been working with districts across the state who have been doing incredibly innovative work. Um, I think in terms of continuing education, we have districts who have online learning, who have provided accommodations for students. We also, I think the governor referenced a partnership with PBS. We recognize that not all children have access to internet at home, so we certainly wanted to accommodate some of those needs. And so starting April 6th, in partnership with PBS stations across the state, and I do want to say a very special thank you to all of them who have partnered with us in very short order. Um, we will be uh, producing and um, broadcasting actual lessons through TV. We are working on having the same accommodations through radio so that students across the state, regardless of whether or not they have access to internet, will be able to get some level of instruction. I also want to say we have districts who are doing incredible work with producing packets and putting those learning packets in um, meals that go home with families. We have a number of districts I want to call out. Cleveland City is a great example, Clinton City, um, Sumner County, a number of really incredible examples where districts have put things online. They have actually distributed packets to homes. They've been partnering with local law enforcement and other community organizations to get those resources to families. Now, in terms of special education and children with disabilities, that has been an ongoing national conversation, and I think continuing to get guidance from the federal government has been incredibly important. They did produce new guidance over the weekend that helped clarify some of the expectations for our schools and districts, and we are currently working with local districts and will continue to do so through three times a week calls with our superintendents about how we can provide services and supports to those children with disabilities as well as those children who are in families who speak a language other than English. We want to make sure every single child has access to some level of academic instruction at home and the accommodations that will be necessary to support those students is something that we're actively working on. So April 6th is going to be a long launch date for a number of those resources. We have all of them posted online on our website, a special COVID component of our website um, where it has FAQs as well as learning toolkits that districts can use to access resources that they can distribute locally. So appreciate the question. And then Chris Bungard from WKRN will go back to you for the last question. Chris, your line is on. Chris, your line is unmuted. You're able to ask a question. Okay, it seems that he's experiencing some technical difficulties. That's what, Sam, what happened to Sam yesterday. It's happening right. to Chris today. All right, well, at this time, we will conclude the press conference. Thank you, everybody, for your time, Governor. Yeah, like let me make, make just a uh, final closing remark, like I said a few minutes ago. Uh, I hope what you have heard today is uh, a reflection and what you've heard over the last eight or nine press conferences is a reflection of how uh, aggressively folks are working not only in state government but all across the state to make sure that we address this in a Tennessee way. Uh, the, the way that I know that we will be able to overcome and get through this uh, uniquely. But again, we can do a lot of things here. But you, every single one of you, owning personal responsibility for your actions, for your behavior, for where you go and what you do, for staying home, for uh, taking, making sure the elderly are protected. Every Tennessean will make the difference between uh, lives saved in this state and, and life, uh, livelihoods protected in this state. So we thank you. Together, we will get this done. Thank you, everyone.